Hi, my name is Amy Stephen, and I'm a conservation biologist with the Natural Heritage Conservation Program of the Wisconsin DNR. Thank you for taking time to learn about potential impacts of climate change on the Scuppernong Basin before our workshop on September 22nd and 23rd. This information provides essential background information to make the workshop a success. The workshop is sponsored by the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, or WIKI. WIKI is a consortium of groups working together to understand, limit, and mitigate climate change. The Wisconsin DNR and the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, or NIACS, are members of the WIKI consortium. You will be meeting my NIACS colleague, Danielle Shannon, on the 22nd as she shepherds us through the adaptation workbook process. Before I begin to describe potential impacts of climate change on the Scuppernong Basin, I need to give you a really quick overview of the project area. My colleagues, Pete Durkop and Ann Corman, will be talking about this a bit more during their, the actual workshop. The Scuppernong Basin is outlined in red. Let me find my pointer. It is outlined in red on this map, and it lies within a discrete geographical basin with even lower and wetter areas to the west and the high and dry interlobate moraine of the Kettle Moraine to the east. While the Scuppernong Basin includes both private lands, denoted with red transparent color, and private lands, this 2022 workshop will focus only on the DNR-owned lands, which is about half of the basin's area. All of the public lands fall within the southern unit of Kettle Moraine State Forest. In order for me to plan out this presentation, I needed to know what the cover types were for our project area, which I present here. The vast majority of the area is a matrix of open wetland and grassland with significant areas of savannas and forests too. These native plant communities all evolved with fire, thus prescribed fire is an important component of natural area management. Small areas of shrubs, farmland, and conifer plantations comprise the rest. The Scuppernong River and numerous spring runs flow through the project area as well. Before I start talking about climate modeling, I want to caution you that climate scientists do not have a crystal ball that predicts the future. Instead, their models generate possible and likely scenarios. We actually favor the term projection over prediction for that reason. We can use climate, climate projections as part of climate adaptation, a form of risk management. If we can plot the range of possible scenarios for the future, we can assess potential risk and adapt with logic and intentionality. In the coming slides, I'm going to give a pretty quick and simple overview of climate projections. I encourage you to learn more about this by looking at the 2021 Wiki report referenced here. Please note that I've embedded hyperlinks to various resources throughout this PowerPoint document. Plus, I have a list of references on the last slide. I will be providing here an overview of the various threats to natural communities, including extreme precipitation, increasing runoff, altered water budgets, increasing temperatures, changes in prescribed fire, forest pests and diseases, invasive species, and brush invasion. The main drivers of climate are temperature, precipitation, and carbon dioxide. 
I'm going to share with you model projections for these drivers and demonstrate how a single change can incite a cascade of secondary and tertiary interactions and impacts. This is a map that our wiki colleagues at UW-Madison produced showing projected change in annual mean temperature by the middle of the century. You can see that the Skuppernong Basin is projected to see an increase in annual average temperature of four to five, four or five degrees. In addition to having increasing annual mean temperatures, we will also likely see more days in the 90s and 100s than we have in the past, longer growing seasons and warmer winters. A longer growing season means that plants have more time to grow and transpire water from the soil to the atmosphere. This, combined with rising temperatures, could lead to drought. Warming temperatures and drought can have negative impacts on wetlands and waters. While portions of the Scuppernong River have supported cool water species, such as brown trout, these climate trends may diminish suitable habitat for such fish. Prolonged drought can also have impacts on stream and wetland hydrology. In uplands, warming temperatures and drought can lead to soil moisture deficit, causing stress or mortality to trees. Wisconsin is projected to have more extreme precipitation events that is, more frequent and more intense storms. Here, you'll see projections for the number of days per decade with more than two inches of rain, showing a shift from 11 days historically to 14. And again, I could show you all kinds of maps like these, but I would encourage you instead to look at the Wiki website and peruse the many different ways that they project that they present their climate projections. It's important to consider not just the total volume of precipitation that falls, but also how and when it falls. Wisconsin is projected to have more extreme precipitation events. I think that we've already had opportunities to observe this trend in action. Here are photos of a storm event in 2017, 2017 in the Scuppernong Basin area. Runoff from these extreme events has greater velocity and carries tremendous amounts of sediment and nutrients. Sites that lie downstream from agricultural fields and urban or suburban developments are the most vulnerable to increasing amounts of these inputs. These have a cascade of impacts in both uplands and lowlands. In uplands, we may see increasing erosion and gully formation. You might see invasives washing in, such as garlic mustard, and tree roots may be exposed. In wetlands and waterways, we will see increasing stream base flow and flooding, diminishment in shoreline vegetation, increasing sediment, nutrients, and non-native invasives. We can consider how surrounding land uses and cover types in the Scuppernong Basin can influence the way stormwater runoff flows across the landscape. Note that we have a significant amount of farmland on adjoining private lands. We have two developed communities to the east and the west, and numerous roads running through and around the project area. We can consider this further using the Presto Light tool on the DNR website. Our project area lies within the Mug Creek Scuppernong River subwatershed. The most significant land cover types are agriculture at 36%, wetland at 32%, and forest at 28%. We need to consider how many of these impacts interact, creating cascading issues. 
with increasing precipitation and more frequent and intense storms, we may experience less infiltration of stormwater to the aquifer and more sheet flow and flooding. More dry periods between rain events, coupled with reduced infiltration, can lead to drought conditions. In winter, precipitation may more often fall in the form of rain or freezing rain rather than snow. If this occurs when the ground is frozen, the precipitation will flow across the landscape, carrying nutrient runoff and sediment to open waterways. Historically, winter snows and soils would slowly thaw in the spring, allowing for groundwater recharge. With rain and freezing rain in winter, this type of infiltration is diminished. Let's consider this information again, but putting focus specifically on groundwater recharge. This is very important as we consider impacts on our wetlands. To review, warmer summer temperatures, drought, and longer growing season can lower groundwater levels and lake levels due to increasing evapotranspiration and plant uptake of water. Furthermore, we can see lower groundwater recharge in early spring if winter precipitation is more often in the form of rain than snow. Conversely, more increasing precipitation overall combined with more frequent and intense storm events may contribute to higher water levels. It's quite possible that condi conditions will continue to fluctuate over time. Important considerations include how various plant species and wetland communities tolerate these fluctuations and whether there are thresholds that will tip the balance toward more dramatic change. Non-native invasives largely benefit from climate change for a variety of reasons. Extreme droughts, floods, and blowdowns create novel disturbances and opportunities for invasion. Increased sediment and nutrient runoff associated with frequent and intense storms enhance its conditions for germination and growth. The wetland and riparian invasive reed canary grass is associated with such disturbances. And as I mentioned before, trees become stressed as they are exposed to drought and extreme heat. The stress increases their susceptibility to pests and diseases. In addition, many insects can detect stressed trees and appear to attack them preferentially over healthy trees. For example, emerald ash borer. While cold winters and prolonged snowpack have been limiting factors for many of our invasives, this may no longer be the case. Forest pests will also be like, more likely to survive with warmer winters and increasing temperatures and milder winters may support the northward shift of invasives such as kudzu. Milder winter and less deep snow allow deer more access for browsing woody species. Winter warming, reducing insulating snowpack and deeper soil frost may also lead to frost injury of plants. Increasing levels of atmospheric CO2 give woody species an advantage as they are able to more efficiently grab moisture from the air through their stomata under such conditions. Invasions by both native and non-native brush in prairies and savannas is already something land managers fight on a regular basis. Now it will get that much harder. The usual approach to brush invasions is prescribed fire but that may be getting harder too. Let's see how. Burning in spring is getting more difficult due to more unusually wet springs and earlier green up. Managers are thus unable to do as many birds or are forced to burn in non-traditional seasons such as fall or winter. Even if conditions support burning, 
Sometimes drought or extreme heat may make it difficult to burn safely or may disallow it altogether. If brush invades open habitats, herbs that carry fire may be suppressed and the microclimate under them becomes cool and moist, making them difficult to burn. Let's now transition to assessing more directly the vulnerability of Scuppernong Basin's habitats and natural communities. An important tool in our adaptation toolbox is Climate Change Vulnerability Assessments, or CCBAs. CCBAs have been done by NIACS and the Wiki Plants and Natural Communities Working Group. Hopefully, you got a chance to look over at least one of the CCBAs that Danielle sent you. If you go to the Wiki website, you can find all of the CCBAs. You'll note that there are two types of assessments. Simplified two-pagers for broad community groups, such as non-forested wetlands, and more detailed assessments for individual natural communities, such as this one for wet mesic prairie. When we assess natural communities for vulnerability, we considered two functions, potential impacts and adaptive capacity. The overall estimated vulnerability is a function of these two scores. I just presented a summary of potential impacts to you in an overview. For this wood, Oak Woodland example, the panel of experts indicated that the most serious potential impacts included increasing non-natives and brush, changes in prescribed fire implementation, and increases in tree pests and diseases. But are there variables that could help this natural community resist or accommodate these threats? That's what we mean by adaptive capacity. We know that many oak woodland sites are degraded due to past land use history with trees like elm and maple dominating the canopy instead of white or bur oak. The ground layer on some sites has been devastated by past grazing and some are isolated on the landscape giving the plants no space to shift across the landscape in response to a changing climate. Our assessment of adaptive capacity for the CCBA represents an average of what the panel of experts deemed typical across the state of Wisconsin. So in this case for Oak Woodland, we thought that adaptive capacity was moderately low based on the fact that we perceived there were many sites that had few to no oaks and were isolated. But for this workshop, it will be your job to evaluate the adaptive capacity and overall vulnerability at a local level, the Scuppernong Basin level. Are the Scuppernong oak woodlands dominated by oaks or by more shade tolerant species? Are these blocks isolated or are they part of a large connected landscape? Let's think about these concepts with the other natural community types. These tables summarize the assessed vulnerabilities of Scuppernong Basin's upland natural communities. The good news is that many of the species associated with all three of these sites are well adapted to drought and extreme heat, including the deep rooted prairie species, oaks and hickories. There are, however, uncertainties related to how climate will impact managers' ability to manage these sites with prescribed fire. Pressure from brush invasion, non-native invasives, tree pests and diseases, Deer browse and frost damage are also major concerns. If fire is insufficient, sites may get significantly brusher or may shift toward more closed canopy systems. What makes an individual stand more resilient to climate impacts? What are those adaptive capacity factors? If they occur within a larger landscape matrix where they can shift in response to changing environmental conditions, they will fare better. If they have diverse species that tolerate a broad spectrum of conditions that can wax and wane over time and space, 
and as stated previously for oak woodlands, if their canopy and subcanopy is dominated by oaks. Similarly to wetlands, landscape context, context matters a great deal. Our prairies and savannas will fare best in places like the Driftless Area and the Southern Kettle Moraine, where they occur in large landscapes secured by a matrix of fire-dependent ecosystems, allowing species to shift to sites with a more suitable microclimate. Small isolated blocks, however, will have fewer options for shifting and will be more vulnerable to detrimental external forces such as wind throw, invasive species, etc. In this map, I've just isolated the oak stands, which would be our oak openings and oak woodlands, and the blue coloring are wetlands. These tables summarize the assessed vulnerabilities of Scuppernong Basin's wetland natural communities to climate change. They are organized from the most vulnerable at the top of the table to the least vulnerable at the bottom. The major impacts, as I summarized previously, include changing hydrology, increasing stormwater runoff, carrying nutrients and sediment, increases in non-native invasives and brush, and changes in the application of prescribed fire. Calcareous fen is the most vulnerable because these wetlands are often small and isolated and are strongly reliant on a secure groundwater source within a narrow range of hydrologic variation. Sedge meadows and wet mesic prairies are highly vulnerable to both changes in groundwater as well as surface water hydrology, sedimentation, and nutrient enrichment and associated invasion of brush, weed canary grass, and other invasives. Adaptive capacity is conferred when wetlands are large and or well situated within a larger wetland matrix, when both ground and surface water influences are secure, and when they have diverse species. Wetlands that occur higher in the watershed are less vulnerable to the cumulative impacts of storm water runoff. Shrub car and emergent marsh are the least vulnerable communities, largely because their species are pre-adapted to fluctuating water levels and they support species that are already common and widespread. Here's a map to help you further visualize the wetlands on this property and how their size and connectivity can influence their adaptive capacity. In the northeastern part of the Scuppernong Basin, you can see how smaller calcareous fen and southern sedge meadow communities are embedded within larger emergent marsh matrices. I will be sharing a series of maps like this before the workshop so that you can further consider the size and context of the various natural communities. This map shows other features that we need con to consider, including the Scuppernong River. Wetlands are translucent blue here. Note the numerous springs flowing from the base of the interlobate moraine. There are these little greenish dots with tails all along. Also note the numerous ditches and areas where streams were channelized. Wetlands may transition in different directions in response to warming temperatures, changing water levels, and changing hydrology. This shows the relative position of marshes, wet mesic prairie, and sedge meadow. These types of transitions could occur within the Scuppernong Basin as water levels fluctuate. During the workshop, we need to consider if we want to do everything we can to prevent such transitions, or if we want to facilitate these trans transitions towards something desirable, or if we want to take a hands-off approach and let nature, nature take its course. Apart from the state natural areas and habitat management areas, there are forest stands throughout our project area that also need to be considered. 
These stands may be managed more for silvicultural opportunities, thus the health and future projections of individual tree species are most important here. The increasing threat of stress on the trees from heat and drought can make them more vulnerable to pests and diseases. Non-native invasives and deer browse can also inhibit regeneration and growth of important tree species. And the loss of insulating snow cover in winter may make trees vulnerable to frost damage. The table here shows projections of suitable habitat for tree species in southeastern Wisconsin for the end of the century. I borrowed this information from the Climate Change Field Guide for Southern Wisconsin Forests, limiting, limiting it to species that I thought were most likely to occur in our project area. These show projections for suitable habitat under two different scenarios, with high change representing the worst case scenario. In the ADAPT column, we are informed if there are factors not considered by the climate models, such as drought tolerance, that may make a species more or less adaptable to future conditions. A plus sign indicates that the species may perform better than modeled. A hyphen indicates that they may perform worse. A dot indicates no significant influence. The suitable habitat change class column offers a comparison of current and future availability of suitable habitat based on climate, soils, and topography. The species capability column offers an overall rating of a species ability to cope with climate change based on its adaptability, its suitable habitat, and abundance. Danielle will be providing a handout with tree atlas data that mirrors this table for you to study before and or during the workshop. A particular note are the poor outlooks for the three conifer species, all three of which occur in plantations in the project area, eastern white pine, red pine, As we think about DNR owned lands within the Scuppernong Basin, there are some questions about future climate that are fuzzy, particularly relating to long term trends in water levels and groundwater recharge. Remember, though, climate adaptation is all about risk management. You need to ask what actions you can take to reduce risk for the basin's natural communities and even take advantage of opportunities that emerge with climate change. Think about how we can hedge our bets toward a desirable future outcome. Danielle and I are looking forward to discussing this further during the workshop on September 22nd and 23rd. And last but not least, here are some references and resources. And with that, I am ending the presentation. Thanks for listening.